These days, visual effects and graphics tend to find their way into just about every edit we touch. And half the time, the audience doesn't even realize it. Things like screen replacements, rotoscoping, object removals, and the always useful motion track text. As editors, we know they're there because many times we're the ones who made them. Hey, I'm Chris, lead trainer at Film Editing Pro, and I'm gonna be your guide for the next three videos. In case it's your first time learning with us, we're a team of professional editors working in and around Hollywood, California, with a wide range of well-known studios and networks. The goal of these next three videos is to start teaching you the kind of visual effects and graphics that you can use in your everyday work as editors. We've got a lot of cool stuff to show you, so let's dig right in. So when you think of visual effects, what comes to mind? Maybe it's the stuff that's completely CGI, like flying dragons, giant transforming robots, and whole fantasy worlds created inside the computer. That's all pretty amazing, but it's a whole other level of expertise and not really what we as editors need to do on a daily basis. So maybe it's working with some of the stuff that we mentioned earlier, like rotoscoping, screen replacement, green screens, and motion tracking. We'll get into a bunch of that here pretty soon. But you know what I bet you're not thinking of? Footage stabilization. Still awake? Or did I immediately bore you to sleep? All right, well, bear with me for a second, and I think you're gonna appreciate what you're about to learn. Here's a common scenario. You've got some footage, usually a handheld shot, and it looks great, but it's super shaky and feels pretty unprofessional. Depending on the editor, there are three options here. Option number one is to cut the shot into your timeline and then do nothing to fix it. Not cool, shame on that editor. Option number two is to apply a stabilizer in your editing software. Now, this is what most editors would do. Depending on your software, your results will vary. Premiere's Warp Stabilizer does an all right job, but you can see that it's not that stable and true to the name of the effect, it's a little bit warpy. DaVinci Resolve also does okay, but there are still issues like here and here. Final Cut Pro and Avid, well, they have similar problems, you get the point. Option number three is to make just a little bit more effort and use some VFX skills to get it pretty close to perfect. But we're gonna go with option one and do absolutely nothing less than over. Just kidding. All right, let's look at option number three and use some VFX. So we're gonna be using After Effects here because it's inexpensive, easy to learn, and incredibly powerful. Let's dig in. There are two methods we're gonna look at here, advanced use of the warp stabilizer tool and the two point tracking method. Let's start with number one. Now for you Premiere users, this is gonna be familiar because After Effects also has a warp stabilizer tool. If we search in the effects panel, drag it onto the footage and simply let it analyze, it's gonna look a lot like the result that we saw from Premiere. The problem here is that the stabilizer sees the foreground in focus and the background is out of focus. So it tries to stabilize the moving face of the woman in the foreground instead of the shot as a whole. This results in a lot of background distortion and a bad end product. In Premiere, that would be game over. There's nothing more you can do. But in After Effects, we can tell the stabilizer exactly what to stabilize and what to ignore. So go ahead and select the Warp Stabilizer here and open up the Advanced tab. You might have tried to turn on the Detailed Analysis and run the track one more time, but you're gonna end up with the same result. So instead, I'm gonna say Show Track Points and check that on. Now the stabilization disappears for a second, but I have all these little points right down here. If they're hard to see, you can increase the track point size right here. And there we go. So now we have all these easily visible track points. I'm gonna go backwards in time to right about here where the woman is close up in frame and I can see a lot of track points on her. And here's the cool thing. I can simply select all these track points right here in my composition with a lasso. Draw all the way around the ones that are on her face and her hair. Just get those ones on her face here and on her body. And with them all selected, simply delete them with the backspace key. Now I'm gonna go ahead and use the playhead and go backwards just to make sure I didn't miss any pieces. So just wherever they keep popping up, just move the playhead, circle them, grab them, and delete them. You can keep doing this while it's restabilizing even. 
Just grab these unnecessary track points here and delete the ones you don't need. It should start to automatically realize what you're trying to do with it. Just delete these track points again, a little bit more as she lifts her head up, and just generally try to get rid of any of the track points on our crying woman here. All right, I'm just gonna speed this up a little bit. Now, once it's done stabilizing, we're gonna turn off the show track points right here, and we'll play it back to see how it looks. Well, there we go. Now the shot is much more stable. It feels like the camera is what's been stabilized and not the motion of the woman who's crying. Now, if the warp stabilizer still doesn't work for your shot, you can try the second method, which is two-point tracking. So I'm gonna go ahead and take this layer and just duplicate it, Command or Control D. And on the duplicate, I'm gonna turn off the warp stabilizer by deleting it, and then just simply turn off the layer underneath it so I don't have to pay attention to it any longer. And with this top layer selected, I'm gonna use the tracker panel and choose the option for stabilized motion. I get the choice between position, rotation, and scale. Since this is a handheld shot, I wanna stabilize just the position and the rotation. Because the camera is moving backwards from our actress, I do not wanna stabilize the scale. Otherwise, it would kinda of lock everything into the frame together right here. Now, since we wanna stabilize the shot as a whole, we're gonna track the background instead of the subject but it's out of focus. So to make it easier for the trackers, I'm gonna zoom in and just enlarge these trackers quite a lot. Kind of like this. Move this first tracker back over here, maybe to the background, right around, let's say here. Just choosing a point of contrast. Now I wanna point out that this center smaller box should go around a distinct feature that you want After Effects to track. The larger box is the search region where it's gonna look for that feature. Think of the larger box like the tracker's peripheral vision. Just don't make it too big because it's gonna get really, really slow. Make it just large enough so that the tracked feature is still inside of the bigger box as you step forward or back by a few frames. So we're trying to track two points that are across the screen from each other so that the tracker can get a sense of how the whole image is moving. On the second tracker point as well, we'll make both boxes a little bit bigger and choose a point on the right-hand side. Again, something with some color contrast would be useful. And just make these boxes much, much bigger so we can actually track these points. And then go ahead and track forwards and see how it goes. And once your tracking is complete, go ahead and click Apply here and choose OK. And we're gonna see that the layer sort of moves out of the way. When you apply the tracking data to your clip, it's gonna add all sorts of keyframes to the anchor point, position, and then if you chose them, the rotation and the scale. So you can simply press UU to collapse your tracks again. So let's have a look. So it's definitely keeping that background stabilized, but it's not actually repositioning the layer for me so that I don't see these edges. What I can do is come over here to this layer, and find the point where the layer looks the most off, like right about here. I can right click and say new null object, and then take this layer and parent it to the null object here. Then on the null object, open up your scale, position, and rotation properties, and make an initial keyframe for all three of those. Now, anytime we move, rotate, or scale the layer, we'll automatically create keyframes. So just start increasing the scale of the layer a little bit, just like this. Maybe change the position so it's better placed in frame. And then go ahead and just move, rotate, and scale the layer as needed to keep this object pretty centered throughout. Don't make too many keyframes, just every couple seconds when you see that things are starting to look off. Great. And we can select all these points and press F9 for easy ease, and then see how that looks. So we have a similar, but noticeably different type of stabilization here. You can pretty quickly and easily try both methods to see which works better for your particular shot. All it took was a couple extra steps that the average editor probably wouldn't either think to do or know how to do. Now let's take a look at another highly useful and common VFX technique for editors, keen footage. Just so we're all on the same page here, keen is a technique that creates transparent areas in footage based on its color like with green screens, 
or its luminance, which are the black and white values in the footage. This is useful for things like separating a subject or an object from the background, punching out areas like TV and phone screens, and allowing you to color correct different parts of footage independently. Keying is a straightforward concept, but as with most things, there are challenges. Let's look at a common example, separating a subject from a green screen. So here we've got this newscaster. On the left, we've got the result of using a color key in your editing software. Pretty unacceptable. On the right, we've got a properly keyed shot using some additional tools and VFX knowledge. When keying, you're gonna run into all sorts of issues. Keying is complex. Way too much to fully get into here in this one video today, but I do wanna give you an idea of how we approach it. So there are two important takeaways I want you to walk away with here. First, the specific effects that we used, and second, the overall keying strategy. Let's have a look. Okay, so here's our newscaster. Now we made a mask around her, and I'm gonna turn off the effects for this layer for a second. You can see that the raw footage is very flat. She's on a green screen. Now under my effects controls, we have a Lumetri color with a custom LUT that was given to me by Leon, one of our other trainers. Then we used key light. Let me just go ahead and turn on all the effects here, and we'll look at each one at a time. We used four primary effects. Lumetri hosted our LUT and gave us control over the look of the footage. Not so much used for keying, but an important step nonetheless when working with raw footage in After Effects. Second, we used key light as the primary tool to punch out the green screen. Key light has a lot more control over what is keyed out and what remains than you're gonna find in most editing software. So it alone is gonna get us much further than a basic color or chroma key effect. Third, we have something called key cleaner, which is used to refine the edges of our subject. When I activate that, it begins to clean up some of the edges. Let me just zoom in so you can see some of those finer details. Very subtle. And fourth, we used advanced spill suppressor to eliminate the color cast from the green screen on our subject. So when I go ahead and enable that, you can see that a lot of the green that was in her hair specifically goes away. So those are the basic effects, but what's equally important when keying is the strategy. Specifically in this case, keying the hair separately from the rest of the subject. The challenge here is the newscaster's blonde hair. Hair is notoriously difficult to key, and blonde hair is the hardest, particularly against, you guessed it, a green screen. And so I have a layer here that's just the hair, with the same effects, but a bunch of different settings. The Lumetri color, the key light, key cleaner, and advanced spill suppressor but the settings are modified so we retain more of the detail in the hair. So if I were just to get rid of this hair layer for a second, you're gonna see the hair is very chopped up here. Doesn't look quite right. That's because the effects on just this newscaster layer are creating that sort of chopped up hair look. So we added one more layer underneath that brings back some of the hair. You can see that I masked this layer out just above her shoulders here, so all we're getting is the hair. As you can see, most of these effects have a boatload of settings to go with them. We'll get into all those in another lesson, but if you can approach your keys using these effects and then remember to strategically tackle different parts of a key separately based on their specific issues, you're gonna end up with a pretty darn good result. Stabilization and keying are pretty big topics, but hopefully these last couple techniques have given you an idea of what's possible with a bit of VFX knowledge added to your editing skills. The days of an editor perched atop a creative throne, cutting only the picture and the dialogue are pretty much over. Yeah, of course, the top 1% of editors who work on big budget Hollywood productions do get the luxury of a large team to support them. An assistant organizes the footage, a music editor handles the music, another builds the sound design, an outside VFX house handles all the visual effects and the graphics, and a colorist corrects and grades the footage. In reality, most editors are not in that position. Most editors are a one man or one woman show. And that means if you don't know how to do something yourself, you've either got to hire someone to do it, which is expensive, or you just got to leave it out entirely, which results in lower quality work. Nothing that we do as editors is rocket science. Sure, it can be complex, but it's totally learnable within a reasonably short period of time. And of course, these days, you can do it all from home. The training we've put together is designed to empower you to create the types of visual effects and graphics that you're gonna need in your edits all the time. And it's gonna make a very big difference in the overall quality of your work 
and the professionalism of your final product. In a couple days, we'll be looking at the graphic side of things. In particular, how to elevate mundane images, footage, and other assets into professional looking highlights of your video. Have you ever tried your hand at making visual effects before? Leave a comment below and we'll see you in the next video.